Thank you. Um, it's kind of uh, exciting to be, they told me, oh, you're a celebrity. It's like, where? So <laughs> I'm happy that actually people read the case study on the energy recovery uh, program that we started in Citrus Heights, California. So I'm Erica Ocampo. Thank you so much for having me here today and thrilled to be here. I'm going to talk about uh, how a specific uh, story about Dow's um, response to Hurricane Harvey. I'm happy that the previous panel didn't talk too much about Harvey. They focus a lot on Sandy, so yay for me. Um, so for you to understand um, what this kind of climate disruptions effects have in a company like Dow that is sizable, uh, you need to understand a little bit of the context of our of our uh, size, of our operations, of the markets that we touch. So uh, many of you might know that we are going through a huge merger uh, that closed in September of last year. Uh, we are merging with DuPont. It's a merger of equals. And from the beginning, it's not meant to stay together. We are meant to kind of redistribute our portfolio of chemistries and a spin off into three uh, companies that are gonna go narrower and deeper into markets and portfolios to become more specialized on their markets. So we're gonna be uh, spinning off into, you know, a material science company that is gonna represent kind of Dow as it is. Uh, then there is gonna be an agricultural company that is Cortiva. And then there is gonna be uh, a specialty mat uh, materials that is gonna be uh, DuPont. So this is kind of, uh, a representation of where we're going right now. And this is a representation of the vast number of markets that we touch across the globe. So you wake up today, you have your phone, your alarm, you went to the bathroom, you took a shower, you shampoos, you're sitting on, on this room. Have you touched Dow products? Absolutely. All of you, thank you very much. You're part of our value chain because we are in all the markets. We are in personal care products. We are in paints and coatings. We are in mobile phones, electric cars, uh, uh, photovoltaic cells. Uh, we are supporting industries like the natural gas industry for extraction. Uh, so we are everywhere. And as exciting has that opportunity to have chemistry working in these many value chains also means that we have a high responsibility to run reliably and efficiently and safely because if a disruption happens to our operations, it has a huge ripple effect globally to all the markets of all the things that we are using today. So it is a huge responsibility and we don't take it lightly. So the main point of showing you this whole transition of the merger and the spin-offs was just to show you how deep, integrated, and how vast is our impact on value chains. But the hurricane happened right before the merger, like one week before, so let's have a look at what Dow is. So we are a sizable company. We have 56,000 employees back the last year. Um, and then we, op we have 100 and 189 sites in 34 countries, offering over 7,000 uh, products. And so it's quite large and we have an, a global footprint, but when it comes to Texas, that's kind of one of our major hearts. Uh, in Texas, we have our, uh, one of our major sites and actually the Freeport Texas facility is the largest chemical manufacturing integrated complex of the Western Hemisphere. And is right there on the Gulf Coast. Um, which exactly it was where uh, Hurricane Harvard decided to visit. And okay, fine, hurricanes are no unusual in that area, but we have an extremely large presence in that area. So we have um, about 12,000 employees on that part that includes Louisiana. Uh, we have major operational assets that represent a significant value for our company. Um, we have uh, an engineering hub, an R&D hub, and the manuf and a manufacturing footprint that is over 31 uh, square miles inside the fence line. So it's very large our impact there. And that's why when the Hurricane Harvey came, it was kind of uh, 
uh, we, I mean, people don't freak out. Like engineers are very like logical, but uh, when you think about the impacts of what will be shutting down our Texas Louisiana operations, you kind of freaked out because uh, it's a big impact to the global value chains. And when you look at it, the chemical industry overall, this is not just Dow, but is deeply integrated into the economies and communities of the Texas and Louisiana, particularly in the areas that have been hard, hard, uh, hit hardest by the storm. So if you think about our impact on people in that region, the chemical industry employs about 79,000 employees, uh, Texans, and 25,000 Louisianans. And we have 121 billion shipments from Texas and 51 billion shipments from Louisiana, which means that this is around one fifth of the total chemical industry shipments in the United States. So imagine if 20% of the entire chemical industry has to shut down for X amount of days, the impacts that it has across the country and the globe. So that's when you really freaked out and you have to, uh, to include this kind of statistics in the way that we do risk management. And we do it a lot. And thank for, I'm so grateful for those people. Uh, because uh, one of my cl close friends at Dow, he is, I call him, he's very depressing because his job is to look at all different types of risks. So everything that could go wrong, he will know. Like he, his entire job is to sit and figure out like the doomsday scenario and what we have to do, uh, which is great for the company. But when you're talking to him, I remember I was going to sublet an apartment because I was taking classes in another state. He's like, you are going to get murdered. Like, <laughs> and because he's thinking about the worst case scenario all the time, like he doesn't stop. And he will be the one who will call me every night to make sure that nobody murdered me that night because somebody might have the key of that apartment. So, um, but I'm grateful for him because he, make sure that when these uh, gray storms and, and natural disasters happen, we are prepared because it's, yes, we have to be safe, but we have to be reliable. And sometimes shooting down these operations are, are very difficult. It takes some time and it can be dangerous. So you have to balance the risk of keeping your operations up versus shutting them down. So during the Hurricane Harvey, actually we shut down the Sidriff operation because it was by the area of the impact of the first um, hit of the Hurricane Harvey. And then we maintain our Freeport operations running uh, at a lower rate. And then the Beaumont facility, when the Harvey decided to come back inland, hit that area as well. So these are risk management decisions that we have plans for and that we have drills for to make sure that we have um, this integrated and that when things happen in an seconds notice we can make the decision. So I wanted to share with you because at the end of the day, every story I'm gonna tell you about how we analyze risk, how we value climate change disruption and democracy and all these things is gonna boil down to people and the decisions they make and the work they do and how they respond to these situations. And I do complain a lot, I'm Colombian, I like to complain all the time about things that happen in the company even when I like them. Uh, but this is one of those occasions where I feel incredibly proud of the culture that our company has created. Um, so let me share with you um, a video about Hurricane Harvey. Harvey posed challenges that were beyond what we saw in a typical hurricane. It made landfall three times. Once in Mexico, once in Corpus, and once here. It's hit every city, every town in Brazoria County. Harvey devastated uh, the city of Richwood. And not so much the hurricane itself, but the floodwaters uh, afterwards. I've never seen anything like this in my life, and I hope I never see it again. It doesn't really seem real until you're driving through this neighborhood like this, and you know every house has belongings out on it, and the lower half of their house is out there for trash. Me and my wife were looking at, uh, at all this stuff, and. Uh, we really didn't know how we were gonna how we were gonna do this. Well, when you start going through every closet, every room, I mean, you know, just a whole lot of work. To see the homeowners 
in, in the situation they're in when we first come in in the morning and, and see how they're kind of downtrodden and, and, you know, very sad about their situation. And then at the end of the day, how appreciative and grateful they are of all the work we've put in. It's a feeling like no other. It's great. It never ceases to amaze you. You have such a catastrophic event and then all of a sudden people are willing to open up and do whatever they can to help each other out. It's very impactful to see that and to get to experience it. This could have been my house and we was blessed to not be hit by this hurricane. So I just felt like it's my part to help out and give back to the community. Yeah, they, they saved me, I can tell you that. You know, what a great company. Dow's committed not only to safety as our top priority, but also making sure that we can help with the needs in the community. We decided that we were gonna open up our schools for breakfast and lunch for a week and allow people to come in and, and uh, eat meals for free. And then Dow said, well, we will fund that. There were some children who came in with their mother and their father. And their mother and father stood back because they thought this was only for the kids. And so they were bringing their kids to eat and they were going to stay hungry. And we had to tell them, oh, no, 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 this is for you too. If it were not for Dow, we wouldn't have been able to provide that service for our community. It's really important to have that nonprofit and private sector work together closely because all that does is allow us to leverage resources and mobilize people to get things done. You have the connections that we don't to get us the donations that we need and we are the ones who are able to get those donations to the people who really need it and that is the great conduit that we have. You can't put a price, you can't put even words on that kind of relationship. It's just something intrinsic that we have here and I wouldn't trade for anything in the world. Okay, so those are the videos. I, when Hurricane Harvey happened, I was in Michigan where I live now, but I live in Texas for nine years. So it was very personal to me what was happening there and I felt incredibly frustrated for not being able to go just right there and aid people in the middle of the storm like if I was Wonder Woman or something like that. But then when you are listening through all the company channels, the great efforts that people already on the site are doing. So we have the responsibility to run safely our operations and we have plans in place to make sure that that happens. And so we have um, priority personnel actually sheltered in place to make sure if anything happens with the operations they are there as first responders. But then we also have to account for the impacts that Harvey had in our employees in, and in our communities. And it was just amazing the response and how people were just willing to help anybody that was in need. And it was automatic. There is no need to ask your leader, hey, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to take some hours to help somebody build their house back. It was just we have to do what we have to do. And I guess that's one of the benefits of the engineering world. We are very task oriented and then okay, this is what we have to do, you go there, do that, you go there, you do that, you go there and do that. And, and that's how really work when Harvey happened. So um, during the first week, uh, the most important thing for us is to make sure that all our employees are accounted for and that we understand if they are okay or if they need help. And when they needed help, uh, we were able to provide temporary housing and uh, we also uh, have, um, rental vehicles for them. We also provided food uh, and we also provided loans uh, if they needed to rebuild their homes. So it's, when you were talking about the topic of democracy, yeah, it's government by people and even though this is not like a government there, but it kind of created this kind of mini democracy in the region where you have, you know what are the skills and the strengths of different partners and automatically there was a tacit agreement between all the partners just to collaborate based on their strengths. So given our um, uh, strength of, of being able to transform, transport food back to Texas, we were able not just to feed our employees that were in sight, but we were able also to feed people in the area. We were able to uh, shelter some state troopers and uh, in the schools we also supported. And then we have to consider not only what was happening to, to Dow and Dow's employees and families, 
But what is happening to the, all the manufacturing industries around us? Do they need help? Do they need a pump? Because if they fail, we fail too. We are neighbors. We are sharing the same area. So it, it is a testament of the true Texan spirit that I really didn't understand until this, really, even though I lived there nine years, that they just, they just hands-on solution makers, right? So it needs to, you do what you need to do. So when it comes to climate actions, uh, people have talked about you know, the, the most uh, used uh, actions, which are mitigation, adaptation, and geoengineering. And I told you about um, the, the mitigation a little bit uh, with um, another story of a Texan as well. So I was talking to somebody who works in the energy business, and he's very Texan, and he said to me, so you buy into all this climate change science. And so I'm doing my eye roll inside my head uh, as I'm trying to like, oh my God, you work for the energy <laughs> business and you're gonna try to talk to me about climate change, not real. Uh, and he, but then it was kind of interesting because I just decided to not talk about it, not, like not to judge him or, or, or continue to challenge him. But then he come back to me and says, you know what? I don't know about the climate change science, I don't believe it's true, but I know that renewables are the right thing to do. So we are aligned, we don't have to agree, we don't have to continue to be analyzing the problem when we know that the direction is the same. So it was kind of interesting because he said to me, by the way, I was the person who enabled uh, the closing of some of the biggest um, renewable energy uh, contracts that Dow has had. And now Dow is one of the top five uh, largest uh, corporate co uh, purchasers of renewable energies in the US. We have 650 megawatts. And I don't know anymore which, because every, every week we get like news from different corporations buying more. So I know we're in the top five. I don't know which number anymore. Um, so it's quite interesting because when it comes to climate change, I think we, we always try to approach it from the doomsday kind of approach. You, if you don't do it, you're gonna die. But at the, same, at the end of the day, just like when Hurricane Harvey, you have to trust that at some level, people want to do the right thing. And even though their way to see it is not the same that yours, it's still their willingness to move forward towards the same direction is there. So you just have to capitalize on that. When it comes to adaptation, well, that's what preparedness was for, right? Like uh, everything that we did before, uh, getting the pumps, making sure, uh, that we can resist hurricanes that are a common place in the Gulf of, uh, Gulf of Texas. Uh, it happens a lot, it is, is increasing in intensity and is happening more often, so those are things that we're continuously looking for because it is expensive to adapt. But we need to do it because again, it will be more expensive if we don't do it because a huge value chain depends on our reliability. So I love this uh, quote from uh, the climate scientist John Hondren, who was also a science advisor of Obama. He said, we basically have three choices, mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. We're going to do some of each. The question is, what's the mix is going to be? So I think we, and, and I added geoengineering there, which I know is very challenging, and it's kind of hard to think that it, it will come up to that. But I think we, we need to be open to all the options and a mix of all of them and coming from different areas. And if we're gonna really just stop just doing incremental changes, but like really move the needle forward, we need to be more open to people using their strengths to move the areas that are strongest for them. So we are the first generation to feel the effects of climate change and the last generation who can do something about it. Uh, this is a quote from former President Obama. And it really resonates because how stressful is to think about it, but how exciting is to think about it too. It opens an array of opportunities. We are uniquely positioned in history to do something about it. Like we have a bunch of business opportunities just when it comes to climate change. Not for us to do it only for our plants and protect protection of our plants, but then it's opening all these new markets when we can help people reduce their footprint or adapt to climate. So I see it kind of like a half full, half empty glass. I tend to be more on the, half, on the full glass because I'm excited about the things that we can do. 
like finally we're feeling the effects, people are like freaking out, but we can be part of the solution. So when it comes to people, uh, it's interesting because when it, sustainability uh, seems to be kind of like a in the air topic for many, kind of foreign, like I don't know about that and, and they don't really want to own it because they are afraid of what they don't understand. So how can we make sustainability more accessible to people? DAO has the 2025 sustainability goals, which are amazing. We have done it over and over again, 10-year 10 10 year goals in 1995, 2005, 2015, 2025. But then at the end of the day, it was usually like a top-down approach. And the people doing the things at work, they were doing the changes, but they didn't understand how their day-to-day -day job impacted sustainability. So we need to make sustainability more accessible to everybody if we really want to move the needle forward significantly to address the issues of climate change disruption. And that's why we decided to create different um, empowering educational and development programs for employees inside of DAO. One of them is the Sustainability Academy. Uh, with the help of the Herb Institute at the University of Michigan, we select every six months uh, 40 employees across the company uh, and we take them for one week training on sustainability, acumen business, and then we have them work on a DAO 2025 sustainability goal for six months on teams. And so what that does is that shows them how they can have hands-on impact on what we do in a company, and the hope is that they can bring that back to their regular roles. Because we cannot hire 10,000 sustainability experts on across the company, but we already have amazing employees with amazing skills that just need to make sure they understand what is their impact. And then I got many emails saying, oh, I wish I could do that, why only 40 people? And obviously it's expensive. So we came up with the idea, well, it's really about making sustainability more accessible to people. And the reason why we did it with the Herb Institute is because I'm a firm believer that you you need to bring the ideas from outside in so they can see inside from a different lens once they come back. Instead of having DAO people teaching the DAO way of thinking about sustainability. The only way to innovate is to bring those fresh ideas. So we decided for Air Week, by the way, happy Air Day coming up, um, to create the elements of sustainability series. So we invited seven professors, uh, via the Herb Institute at University of Michigan. Uh, some of them are also from Duke, another one is from North Carolina State, and from Ivy School of Business. And they are recording, they recorded with us one hour lecture on a fundamental of sustainability, call it climate change, call it people behavior, call it triple bottom line, but is directly from the professors, is their material, is what you will learn if you were on the university with them. And we decided to open it up to anybody who wants to see it because, yes, it's great that our employees see it and we are going to ask our employees to see it. But also, it's great if the employees of our customers and the general public gets to see it as well. So if you Google elements of sustainability series, you will get to the link um, here. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter. I'm tweeting all the time about the event because I think it's awesome. And we invited a lot of our customers to be listed as sponsors. So we went and asked six of our customers like L'Oreal, Unilever, Novinion, Aptiv, uh, to join us on this journey. Because when you engage those employees that have also a really large group of employees, then you get to really have this impact. So by making people uh, enabling people to empower themselves through knowledge, you're really having this kind of larger effect on the overall sustainability performance. And you are able to have that perspective of new ideas, people who own the ideas and actually implement them. Because how many, I mean, how many of us are actually sustainability practitioners at a company? And we, in my company, we are, we have a lot of them, but we are only a few when you look at the 56,000 employees and the impact that our operations has. So it is better when we can empower people through knowledge uh, so that we can move the sustainability development forward. With that, this is my information. I appreciate your time and thanks for having me here.